Come into this virtual space and breathe. Prepare yourself for worship. Wherever you are, in your living room, your kitchen, your bedroom, your home office, whether you're watching on a tablet or a laptop or a desktop or perhaps even your phone, turn off the distractions and breathe. Breathe in the mystery that is spring. Breathe in the mystery that is found in a God who somehow brings new life out of death. Breathe in the mystery of a community that can gather even while staying apart. Breathe. Breathe deeply the possibility that there is new life for each one of us. That regardless of what we bring to worship, that somehow those feelings, those experiences can be transformed into something new. Christ is risen. Have you heard? Do you know? Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. We light this candle, believing in the power of new life, and believing that there is new life in each of us, planted there by God, and that we come to experience the new life of God and to blow and fan that flame of new life in ourselves and one another, so that we in turn can be light to the world. Come and worship. Breathe deeply of the Spirit. Welcome, everyone, to this time of worship. 
My name is Kathy Underwood. I'm an ordained minister in the United Church of Canada, and my formal ministry is as part of the palliative home care team, where I work with patients and families who are struggling to live fully until they die. I also am a voluntary associate minister with First United Church in Owen Sound, where Crystal McGee, who many of you know, uh, have known as a student here, uh, is the full-time ordained minister. Thank you for this opportunity to lead in worship. And I'm really delighted again to be sharing that leadership with Ted Spencer on the piano and organ. And today, Dale Fawcett, who is chair of your board, will be reading the scripture. So thank you to one and all. And particularly thank you to those in the Netcast ministry who make this technology available and who share this ministry with you who make it possible for us to create a virtual community together, a community of worship, of encouragement, of education, and of provoking one another to greater good. Let us pray. God of love, God of Jesus who called himself the true vine, we come before you as a work in progress we are a branch of the vine of love, and we come here to be watered and fed and pruned and shaped so that we might bear good fruit, fruit that brings about love and justice and peace to ourselves, but also to those around us, to the society in which we live, to the world in which we live, and to all of your beloved creation. We thank you for the life of Jesus who taught us to love and for your ongoing presence in the Spirit which leads us into ever greater faithfulness in our hearts, our minds, and our living. Be with us, O God, in this time of worship. This we pray. Amen. And we begin our worship singing as we always do, and this morning we begin with Voices United 166, Joy Comes with the Dawn. noticed that there's something different on the communion table today, kind of wrapped around the cross. I wonder if you know what it is, and if you guessed a crown of thorns, it's not. It's actually a wild grapevine. 
Jesus, in the passage of scripture that we're going to hear from Dale in a few minutes, Jesus talks about himself as like the grapevine. And he wants us to think of ourselves as the branches and the tiny tendrils that are on the grapevine. It's not what we're going to talk about right now, though, in terms of the vine, but rather what a healthy grapevine produces. If it has the right things, like the right amount of sun and the right amount of rain and the right soil and things for it to hook on to. Do you know what you would pick off of a vine like this in the fall if it had what it needed? Well, if you guessed a grape, you would be right, but not the grape like what we buy in the store. Those great big juicy green ones or the, or the dark concord ones. No, not like those. A wild grape is much, much smaller. And sometimes in all by itself on a tendril, sometimes with a few other berries but, or in other grapes, but not at all like the ones we buy in the store. Have you ever tasted a wild grape? Well, they're interesting because they're small, and if you pick one off and taste it, sometimes they're very sweet. It's almost like they've taken all the sugar that's in a big fat grape from the grocery store and compressed it into a tiny little wild grape. Now, on the same plant, though, you might pick another grape from further down the vine where maybe it didn't get as much sun, and that grape might taste kind of bitter or dry. It might dry out the inside of your mouth. And then if you go to somewhere else on the vine and pick another grape, you might find that it's more sour. And the one right next to it might be sweet again. And that's what makes it so interesting to make wild grape jelly, is because all of those wonderful, diverse kinds of tastes mixed together to create something that one grape alone tasting just, or all the grapes tasting just like one, you wouldn't get the same flavor in your jelly. And I think that's like us. We might all grow in the same vine. We might all go to the same church. We might all live in the same community. We might even look a lot like each other. But you know what? Each one of us is truly unique. And the jelly if the jelly is the goodness that we can bring about in our communities, well, the jelly needs all of us to do our part, even the ones who are bitter and who make things a little bit sour. We need all those flavors. We need all those people to come together in order to have a community of faith, but also a wider community that truly has the full understanding of what it is to bring about goodness, to overcome racism, to stand up for what is right, to take effective action against climate change. We need everybody. And so I wonder, as you come to worship today, I wonder what kind of grape you are feeling like. Are you feeling like a grape that brings about sweetness and lightness and delight all around you? Or do you feel more like a grape that is kind of dried out today and you're coming to worship because you need some encouragement to become that sweet, tasty grape again? All I know is that God cares regardless and that we are invited to come exactly as we are. And then to be open to the branches and the people around us so that we can be changed and made into our very best selves, the self that God imagined me to be when God first imagined me. So on this day, I hope you think about grapes, and I hope you think carefully about what kind of grape you want to be in this community of faith and also in the world in which we live. In worship, we pray together. It's one of the things we do. And so we are going to move from this time of talking about grapes 
into a time of praying. One of the things that we do in worship that is unlike most of our everyday life is we pray together. And today's prayer is a blend of a scripture reading from the Psalms and a prayer that was specifically written for this time of COVID-19 by the Reverend Ken Howcraft, who is with the Methodist Church in, in the United Kingdom. And so I thank him for his gift of this combining a prayer of lament with our prayers today. It's a bit long, so settle deeply into wherever you are. Feel free to open your eyes or do whatever feels right as you hear these words and hopefully live into these words as they fill you. Let us pray. How shall we praise you, O Lord our God? When we are locked down, how can we praise you? When the doors to the churches and mosques and synagogues are barred and your people cannot assemble. When those desperately in need of money and work cannot even wait in a line in a marketplace. When we have to circle around people in the street and line up for shops while being careful to keep the right distance. When we can only communicate by hearing on the phone or seeing on the screen or maybe even just waving through a window. When we cannot spend time with our parents and children, our grandparents, our grandchildren, other family and other friends when we cannot touch them in their flesh and blood to know that they are really alive, God, how shall we praise you? How, like Thomas, can we see or not see and still believe that there is new life among us? How shall we praise you, O God? Is it possible, like some say, that you are plaguing us with this virus to punish us? because we have done wrong, or thought wrongly, or felt wrongly, or just been wrong? Oh God, if that is the case, then why do only some die? And why is it, oh God, that the ones who are the least, who are the most marginalized, why is it that they die the most? Some would say, oh God, that you're trying to teach us a lesson, but then if that is so, why are we so slow to learn? And how are we to find the answer if we do not even know the right question? God, are you the same loving Yahweh who comes to us in our sufferings and opens up the way to new life in Jesus? Oh God, so many places and people are hurting. Do you not see them? I can see them. Here is who I see, oh God. I see Bill Timmons, who is recovering from a stroke. And I think of Bill and his family, who have also just said goodbye to his mother, Bessie Lawrence. I see others, oh God, who are grieving others who are overwhelmed by isolation. I see others, O oh God, who are so afraid that they cannot even greet their friend on their front porch. I see, O oh God, the frustration of so many waiting for vaccines. I hear the anger, O oh God, of decisions made and unmade and turned around and turned upside down. And we are afraid, O oh God. And so we name, we name our politicians and our public health leaders and all the others, O oh God, who are trying to make the best decisions that they can. Grant us, those who follow, the patience, the courage to ask questions when questions must be asked and the faith in each other that indeed each one is trying their best. We pray for nurses and physicians and personal support workers and respiratory therapists, so many 
who every day face the grind of wearing a mask for 12 hours a day, who work understaffed and overstressed. We think of so many others, oh God, who are adapting to new ways of working, whether it's working from home or working online, whether it's doing brand new jobs or perhaps creating brand new businesses or adapting your previous business to the new demands of this time. God, we pray for each one who is in ICU wherever they are. And we think particularly of people in Brazil and France and India where the variants are overwhelming their healthcare system. We pray, O oh God, for the places in the world where the pandemic is one of just many horrors. We pray for the two Michaels in a Chinese prison. We pray for the Uyghur people, for Kurds and Palestinians, and countless others who are oppressed for their race, their religion, their ideology, their orientation, their understanding of who they are. And we pray for your beloved creation that aches for us to take responsibility for our impacts on this earth, to take seriously climate change, and to take action both as individuals and collectively. Lord, we will try to praise you. Through gritted teeth, we will try to praise you. And Lord, when I cannot pray, when I cannot worship, then help me to be aware of all your people and saints and angels hovering, or hovering around and lifting me up. When I feel alone, help me to feel you saying, peace be with you. Lord, we will praise you. We will praise you. And all of our prayers, we sum up with the words, the prayer of Jesus, who spoke to you, O oh God, as a loving mother, as a loving heavenly parent, as a creative mystery. We pray to you, O oh God.
Good morning. Our scripture reading this morning is from John 15, verses 1 to 8. I am the true vine and God. The creator is the vine grower. The vine grower removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit is pruned to help it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Some branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this is God and the Creator glorified that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. Here ends our first reading. Many are the branches of the one vine. Our one vine is Jesus. Many are the branches of the one vine. We are one in Christ. I found this old wild grapevine growing along the fence on our farm. And when I first looked at it, I thought, that is a dead old grapevine. But you know, Jesus took this image of an old dead grapevine, and he put that in words. I am the true vine, and you are the branches. Abide in me for Apart from me, you can do nothing. This, this old, presumably dead, old wild grapevine, as I say, was growing on the fence, but it also was growing up through the branches of an apple tree. And at first I thought I could just pull it down, but no, it was really wrapped around. So I actually had to get up on the fence and climb up onto that first big bough of the apple tree, a big old apple tree, and then kind of tug, hoping that I would ultimately win the battle of tenaciousness over the grapevine, and as you can see, I did. But you know, getting hold of this old wild grapevine got me thinking about tenacity. Times that we've had to be tenacious because of things that have happened in our world in the last year. We're no longer able to gather the same way, and it's easy to feel disconnected from one another. And when I think about examples of tenacity, because I've been to a few of your board meetings, I don't have to think very far. Because I think of the centering prayer circle and the pastoral care team. People who, despite the necessity of staying apart, found ways to bring people together. And I think about the Easter Basket Initiative, where people contributed money and treats and baskets, and they told the pastoral care team, who really needs connecting right now? Who is feeling particularly alone? And bingo, or happy Easter, baskets appeared. Another example of your, the work that you have done is, in spite of money being short, your board decided to free up some funds to pay for lunches at Gray Gables and at the hospital for the staff there to tell them, we see what you're doing. We see how hard you're working and we care and we encourage you. Those are examples of tenacity of love in action in times that demand us to be different than we've been before. 
I can think of other people who have been tenacious in standing up for righteous causes. The Martin Luther Kings of this world, the Gandhis, so many. The people who work through Black Lives Matter and quiet no more, silent no more. We think of all those people who stand up for environmental protection and who work against climate change. They are tenacious in the face of great adversity and great despair, and yet they continue. We can be tenacious like the grapevine and bring about great good. But we can also uh, be tenacious in holding on in ways that don't help and sometimes hurt. I can think particularly of times in the church when we have held on to old belief systems and old ways of understanding the Bible that have led to things like the justification of apartheid, the justification of slavery, the justification of women not having the vote. We can be tenacious in our desire to hang on to the things that work really well for us and be afraid to let go, to let God's new thing, God's new life emerge. Yeah, tenacity, it can work both ways. What are the places in your life where you have been tenacious in your desire and action to bring about good? And are there places in your life where maybe you need to let go a little in order to bring about good? The lesson of a grapevine. Many are the branches of the one vine. Our one vine is Jesus. Many are the branches of the one vine. We are one in Christ. I felt badly at first when I severed this beautiful, large branch from its woody stem. I felt badly for it. And then I remembered a healthy vine needs to be pruned. And in fact, in the scripture, Jesus said, every branch that bears no fruit is cut away and thrown into the fire. And even the branches that are pruned, or even the branches that bear fruit are pruned again, that they can bear more fruit the next year. Sometimes we have to prune a lot. And we experience pruning in our lives too. And when we experience pruning, it is often painful. I know a woman who I work with who has a progressive neuromuscular disease. She feels like she's being pruned every day. She's lost all her physical independence. She relies on other people to help her with even the most simple of tasks, right down to the task of breathing. And just when she felt that she had been pruned more than she could stand, Her husband left her. She feels like she is being pruned and the suffering that she experiences is beyond what most of us can ever imagine. Being pruned is painful. Sometimes being pruned is necessary and sometimes, even when it seems meaningless, being pruned can result in unexpected gifts. This lady who I know, who talks a lot about suffering, also talks a lot about meaning. 
And she talks about how her life has meaning regardless of what her husband might think. That her life has meaning as long as she draws breath. She finds joy in the smallest of things. Seeing a robin at the window. Seeing a daffodil when she never dreamed that she would see life after this snow. Oh, she can find immeasurable gifts, even in the face of what we think might be unbearable pruning. There are times when our church has been pruned, too. Times when we have made a difficult decision and perhaps not everybody agreed. (laughs) And people got angry and some people got hurt and some people left. That can be an experience of pruning, and we look for meaning. We look for hope, and we look for reconciliation. And we look for what can come when we allow ourselves to be pruned, when we don't run away from the pruning. I wonder where you are being pruned right now. I wonder who you turn to for comfort and encouragement so that you can persist through the pruning with the belief that new life comes even from what appears to be dead. The lesson of the grapevine. Many are the branches of the one Our one vine is Jesus. Many are the branches of the one vine. We are one in Christ. Oh, there's a lot of lessons that we could take from this old grapevine. But the last one we're going to talk about is its capacity to be flexible. Like I said, it grew up into the apple tree. It would have grown into the basswood if it had been like one foot closer. And once it gets to another branch, it creates all these tiny little tendrils, like strings, like yarn, that wrap around the branches and make sure that it isn't pulled away. It is a model of resilience and flexibility. And I think about you and I. I think about the church. The last year has seen us have to be adaptive, resilient, flexible, in ways that we might have dreamed were not possible. We might have thought we will never go there in terms of using YouTube or Vimeo, and here we are. We might have thought that the church doors close and that's it. Faith is over. Christian education stops happening. We become disconnected from one another, and yet we find new ways. Somebody I know said they could never quite get their act together to come to church as a couple on Sunday mornings. But all of a sudden, when it was available to them at any time that they wanted to watch it, they started making a point of sitting down with their coffee, husband and wife, and spending time singing the songs, listening to the story, disagreeing with the minister when they preached the sermon. And their faith has grown in ways they never could have believed possible. Yeah, the lesson of the grapevine is, how is it that we can be as flexible as we can possibly be while remaining within within the beliefs that we hold dear? We might end up looking very different, doing things very differently, 
But if we have learned nothing else in this year, if we have learned nothing else from the grapevine, we can be sure that <laughs> regardless of what you and I look like or what we're doing, God's still here. God is still active and present and bringing about new life. And for once, maybe we're learning that God really doesn't belong in the building. God's out there. God's out where you are, in the real world, living and moving and being revealed. So how will you be flexible? How will you be tenacious? What fruit will you bear? All of these are the lessons of the grapevine. And my hope this day is that you consider your faith in light of the grapevine. How will you grow in your faith because you have heard the story of the grapevine? Thanks be to God that we have ears to hear and eyes to see and hearts and minds that are open to understand and to live fully into this world. Amen. And we move from this time into our closing hymn, which is Christ is Alive. Jesus said, I am the true vine, and you are the branches. Abide in me as I abide in you. You have spent time abiding. And now we're called to go out into the world to be the branches, to be the fruit that brings delight to the world around us. And as you go, may you go knowing that Jesus, who is the true vine for us, May you go knowing that God, who is creative spirit, hovers around us and in us. And may you know that in this day and every day, you do not walk alone. Amen. You shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills will break forth in your hands and all the trees of the hills will clap, will clap their hands. And all the trees of the hills will clap their hands. The trees of the hills will clap their hands. The trees of the hills will clap their hands as you go out with joy. You shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills
hills will break forth before you. There'll be shouts of joy, and all the trees on the hill.